from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Mountain Mirage by Joaquin Miller I have set down the following facts, well known to nearly every old gold hunter of the far northwestern states at the request of my old partner in the express business, T.R. Mossman, now of Seattle, Washington. For my own part, I do not believe in this sort of literature and feel certain that I could do a great deal better than write stories of this kind and that you could do a great deal better than read this kind of work. So bear in mind that I do not ask you to read a line of it or even to believe any more than you can help believing. It began this 10-day storm in the Idaho mountains with a small rain of which the Bible speaks. At first it was only a low cloud that crept away stealthily and white through the black tops of the tall pine trees on the mountainside only a little way above our camp. Then the clouds grew gray and dragged heavily along the ground and through the long yellow grass of late autumn as if very weary. Then the clouds seemed to be afraid to go further on they began to make familiar with our very beards. They lay low on the grasses and stayed with us all night. They peered in at our tent doors, and we had to keep up big fires and to button up both tent and overcoat to keep dry. At least this was the state of affairs as I found them on my arrival of the express from Walla Walla on my way to Millersburg, 15 miles further on up and in the heart of Mount Idaho, where they were shoveling up gold from the grassroots in the newly discovered Idaho mines, as if it had been wheat on a threshing floor. I wanted to push on that night so soon as I had opened my pack, made fast to keep out the clouds, and delivered the dozen or two letters which I had chanced to have for the dozen or two men whom I found storm-bound here. But the waters were tumbling down out of the treetops. The earth was filled with water and was flooding at every pore. It was simply absurd to attempt to force a mule up the steep and slippery mountain before me. It was as much as life was worth to attempt the pass on foot. And although I knew that the rival express Wells Fargo with two messengers was close behind, I reluctantly put up for the night at the hotel tent kept by Charles Silver a Jew with a Nez Perce Indian woman for a wife. At daylight next morning, I found the clouds had abandoned the siege and withdrawn to the mountain tops. The air was soft and warm and still, not a breath, not even a bird. The air, the earth, and all things of the earth were ominously still indeed. The clouds lay in pretty white patches, snow white, above us and all about us in the lifted distance. Through these snow-white rifts and drifts the golden morning sun poured in mellow glory on the mighty mountain sides that rose above the roaring and tumbling river beyond the mouth of the creek where we lay. Our camp, or rather, the dozen tents that made up this new town, was close by the mouth of Whitebird Creek, made famous as the scene of the first battle in the late war with Chief Joseph and where many a white man bit the dust. The White Bird Creek leaps headlong with a hop and a skip and a jump away out into the roaring waters of the Salmon River. This river runs into the Shoshone or Snake River, this into the Columbia, and the Columbia into the Pacific Ocean at Astoria, as you all know. Now this Salmon River was, is, and will be to the end of all rivers one of the roughest, swiftest, and ruggedest in all the mountains of Idaho, and that is saying a heap. Everything had to be carried into the new mines 
on the backs of either men or mules. The trail twisted and curved and corkscrewed and clung and writhed like a serpent in torment on the rocky and almost perpendicular bluff. It hung in the air along the shelving and sliding banks hundreds of feet above the foaming waters. If a mule lost his foothold, goodbye mule, goodbye man. As for myself, I always got off and walked along here, not infrequently taking my cantinas, especially if loaded with gold, on my own shoulder. But they were making a new trail, a tall road, it was called, high above and on better ground. In fact, it was even then completed all but putting a bridge across a great canyon or cleft in the granite rocks dignified by the name of White Bird Creek, at the mouth of which, as said before, we were now basking in the new morning sun and congratulating ourselves that the storm was over. The new trail was only about half a mile above us and clearly visible for a long distance. My mule was at the door, ready. I had weighed out the dust to pay my bill at the tent hotel and was drawing the cinch tight and strong for a hard ride when suddenly down out of the warm sunny heavens there began to tumble hailstones as big as hen's eggs. It lasted only long enough, this cannonade of hailstones, to make my mule break away, but not till I had jerked off my cantinas and escaped with their precious contents to cover. Then thunder and lightning. This lightning struck struck and stabbed the mountain to the heart right across the river level with our faces and not five hundred feet distant. The dirt and stones and debris flew in the air and rained down in a deluge. The earth simply moaned with pain. The thunder was not thunder. It was the bursting open of the earth. It seemed to be the crack of doom. The cheery lightness that had been only ten minutes before was now all blackness and dismay with seams and streams of lightning. We were blinded and overcome with awe and terror. The mountainsides, made soft as ashes from the long rain of days before, began to loosen, to roll, to rumble, then tumble headlong into the river. I now could see, or rather hear, how worlds were formed, how river courses and mountains were channeled out, filled up or forever changed to suit the whim or fancy of the fearful gods of thunder that fashioned them. My goodness, my pack train, what will become of that? I told them to take the new trail, and now, my God, they are lost, they are lost. This was Pike, moaning to himself in a corner of the big tent. I never knew any other name for him than Pike. He was a tall, fine-looking man from Ohio, of middle age, good address, first-class character, and possibly his real name was Pike. Pike's pack train was the finest on the road. All mules, young and strong, and a fortune to the owner. This storm did not last ten minutes. It was simply too terrible to last longer. That storm had lasted ten hours. The world, or at least that portion of it where it lay, would simply have ceased to be. Even as it was, blocks and patches of the mountain half a mile broad in places, had plunged headlong out of place and left only streaming yellow streaks of clay and sand, as if the very bowels had been torn from out the earth. Then the sun came out, almost as suddenly as it had left us. Then a man, the cook, came tearing in to where Pike was helping me tighten up the letters in my cantinas, a precaution against another cloud burst while on my way over the mountain shouting at the top of his voice pike's pack train pike's pack train safe and sound up yonder on the new trail come and see pike come and see silver the man who kept the tent hotel sprang out from behind the bar and started for the door but his indian wife with blazing eyes and wild gesture caught him and held him back my two hands were full just at that moment but pike dropped everything and rushed out to find the whole camp craning its neck up to the new trail where the pack train in full view of all was making good time up around the mountain as if no storm had ever been. I heard the men shout and shake hands with Pike and roar out their hearty congratulations. I heard the bell of his bell mule 
between these outbursts of feeling and good fellowship. Now, mark you distinctly, I heard that bell as clearly as ever I heard any church bell. And indeed, I heard that bell more clearly and more distinctly. Because you see, in my business as carrier of letters, I had to know, and know well, the sound of every mule bell on every mile of that road. For much of my riding was done by night, and then often a pack train would be half a mile off the road for grass or water, and even if I had nothing for either the master or the men of the train, it was my place to know where every train on the trail was, in order to answer questions of concern to merchants waiting for their goods and all that sort of thing. So you see, I knew that Bell of Pike's pack train. I knew the sound, the shape, the size, the quality, the very cost of it, for Pike was my friend and he had explained when riding with me ahead of his train one day that his bell was the sweetest and clearest toned bell on the road because it was largely silver. He now brought the crowd in to drink at the bar. I did not drink because I never liked liquor in those days. And then besides that, the boys whose gold I carried had a preference for sober expressmen, whatever they might be themselves. But even as they drank and I completed my packing, I heard that bell up above us on the mountain more distinctly than any church bell. I repeat it, for church bells, you know, are much alike, differing mainly not in quality but in volume of sound. Well, boy, if you don't look out, Mossman and Miller's Express will be beat by my pack train, said Pike, smiling back over his shoulder at me as he set down his tin cup at the pine bark bar and passed out of the tent. I'm off, Pike, good-bye, and I hastily threw my cantinas on the saddle, pommel, and swung my leg across my mule, which had been brought around at the first sign of the sun. Say, say, tell them I'm okay, and we'll catch the pack train before it gets to Millersburg. Okay, Pike. Hunky-dory, Miller. My mule scrambled up the sliding and slippery hill, and I never saw genial old Pike again nor even heard of his pack train any more, except only that it was not. And now, a paragraph of digression. I have often seen, as thousands of others have, what is called the Sahara Mirage on the sandy levels of Africa, but all that is nothing compared to the weird and wondrous mirage constantly met with on the plains of America. Not six months ago, a man at Denver a man whom I knew to be absolutely truthful told me that he had seen lifted up in the heavens not only entire cities but had once seen his own house in his own town although that town was at that moment more than 50 miles distant with the mountain intervening. I must admit that I have never seen anything nearly as wonderful as that in all my 40 years of the plains off and on but I will tell you this I have seen enough to fill a book full of most marvelous things, things of almost indescribable beauty and glory and grandeur. And the pity to me is that learned and scientific men do not take up this matter and try and explain it a little, and let us really know whether these things are of this world or the next. Now, as to this mountain mirage. Why? This mountain mirage is as far above the mirage of the plains as the mirage of the American plains is above the mirage of Sahara, and two, it is very rare, as rare as remarkable, and when an old mountaineer sees a mountain mirage, he is suddenly, and from that day forth, to the not distant end of his days, a sober man. And yet, some men live a good long time after seeing this sign hung up in the heavens of the rocky and the bitter root mountains. The only absolute conclusion connected with the tradition is that a man who once sees the mountain mirage must soon or late die by violence. But to get back to the trail through the snow over the mountain to Millersburg. I urged my mule almost beyond his strength as I came near the junction with the new jack trail. This was partly because I was a boy and enthusiastic partly because I was fond of bantering and shouting back in their own tongue to the leather-clad Mexican muleteers, and partly, and no doubt, 
mainly because I wanted to cheer the handsome fellows after the storm with the message from Pike. I kept continually rising up in my stirrups and now and then leaning low to look under the long black bows of pine that hung heavy with snow on the mountain top. No sign. I kept listening for the clear soft sounds of the silver bell. It was like death, and my hair stood out with terror and dismay as I came to the junction of the trails and could see not even so much as a track. I strained my eyes so hard in the snow that they looking ahead, looking back, looking down at the deep narrow trail in the snow before me that I became snow blind before I reached the express office and had to be let in by some miners whom I fortunately overtook before entirely losing my sight. This snow blindness is not painful at first but oh the daggers that pierce your sockets the following night. My older brother who by good chance was mining at the time there took charge of my affairs and the next day came out of the mountains and kept on down with me as far as Luston, where I could have medical attendance. And here, having saved a big bag of gold dust I sold, or rather gave away, my half of the express line, and never again saw the mountaineers of the phantom pack again. As for the real pack train, it had perished by an avalanche bodily only a few seconds before men saw its shadow in the sun above us. And now, let me tell you what became of the men who saw that mirage. Mind you, I saw nothing, only heard the bell. That man who came rushing in to tell Pike was the waiter cook of the crude tent hotel. He was killed by a friend of mine, whose name I will not give, from the blow of a hatchet in that same tent. Pike was shot in the forehead and killed at that place by Matt Bloodsoe, only a few days after he saw the phantom train. Bloodsoe, after killing two other men, was killed in Arizona. Cy Bradley killed in Arizona. Alex Carter hung at Helena. Boone Helm hung at Butte City. Whiskey Bill hung at Bozen, I believe. I know he was hung in Montana somewhere, but I'm not certain of the place. Cherokee Bob killed at Florence. Bill Willoughby killed same time and place. Dave English, Billy Peoples, and Nelson Scott all hung together by vigilantes at Luston two months later. I believe there was no other one present at the time the mirage was seen except myself and Silver and his Indian wife. I've been told that my partner Mr. Mossman was there but he asserts and I know he was not. It was my business to know where he was and I know that he was not within 200 miles. Others again say that Arthur Chapman, the famous guide and friend of General Howard, all through the reason Nez Pierce campaign was there at this time spoken of. He was not there as I well know. But in Walla Walla he is still living a most truthful and upright man, greatly respected and I believe still the army at the solicitation of General Miles who succeeded General Howard in the Pacific Department. My old partner Mossman also still lives and visited me here within the year. Now, this story of the mountain mirage, as well as all stories of this phenomenon, is rare. You can read and you can hear tell any day of remarkable things connected with the mirage of the plains. But a mountain mirage? Well, you will travel far before you find a man who has seen it and no man who has not seen it believes it in the least. As for the man who has seen it, well, he is not sociable. At least he is not in the habit of going round and telling people that he is under sentence of death. As said before, there are better tasks than either the writing or the reading of such stories as this. But back of the request that prompted the setting down of these facts lies the earnest desire for some plain common sense reason for the mirage in the valley or on the mountain let our learned men answer more than a quarter of a century ago when all this was fresh in my memory i asked a famous savant in paris to explain this mountain mirage he put his head down and his shoulders up 
and then slowly balanced his two palms in the air close up under his double chin as if weighing some weighty proposition but he remained silent very respectfully but very earnestly I again entreated him to tell me what this thing they call the mountain mirage may be and then very respectfully and very earnestly he answered the mountain mirage it is not it is impossible then what was it the men saw I will tell you my son and I bowed my head as he looked me in the face for he was very serious as he said in a voice hardly above a whisper il était un fantôme mon fils 